My name is Sam Bucknin, and I'm the author of Malignant Self Love, Narcissism Revisited. Was Alexander the Great murdered in Babylon? In a historical mystery which combines Dan Brown's narrative panache, but with far superior writing skills, Agatha Christie's sense of drama and mise en scene, and Paul Johnson's synoptic view, Graham Phillips makes a convincing case that indeed he was. Alexander the Great Murder in Babylon, published by Virgin Books in 2004, is as thorough as any scholarly study, footnotes and all, and yet it is compulsively and breathtakingly riddled. The book opens with the events of the fateful banquet in 323 BC. 32-year-old conqueror of the known world, Alexander III, known as the Great, fell ill <coughs> with the most unusual symptoms and then died. For some reason, his hideous expiry has been attributed to malaria, typhoid, or alcohol poisoning. But Phillips demonstrates irrefutably that the king was assassinated, his drinks laced with fatal herbs. Having considered the means, Phillips then proceeds to review the motives and opportunity each of the suspects had. And what a list it makes. By the end of his ego-driven life, Alexander had converted his entire entourage into a gaggle of bitter, vengeful, skimming courtiers and spurned wives. Phillips shines a proverbial spotlight on each suspect in turn, analyzing his or her relationship with the young portent, the promise and the inevitable disappointment and disillusionment, the love turned to virulent, seething, pernicious hatred, or to cold, calculated, merciless self-interest. Antipater, the long-suffering soldier who feared that he is about to be executed by an increasingly more paranoid Alexander. Arideus, the king's older brother, intermittently mentally incompetent, but sufficiently coherent to envy and resent his sibling. Barsin, the gorgeous, captive-turned-wife, jilted for a younger woman, saddled with Alexander's first, first child. Seleucus, the able officer whose meteoric rise via the military ranks may have tempted him to seize even more power. Roxanne, Alexander's first wife and queen, driven insane by her jealousy of Alexander's Persian second wife, Statira, daughter of the defeated Darius III. Meliagel, who frowned upon Alexander's self-deification and who survived the purge of the loyal Macedonian cohorts in favor of Persian recruits. And Statira, who openly threatened to kill Alexander to avenge her father's death. Not to mention Perdiccas, Alexander's second-in-command, an instant beneficiary from his untimely death. Phillips then proceeds to place the whole event in intricate, rich, and panor panoramic historical and cultural context, and to suggest a plausible solution to the enigma of Alexander's murder, the culprit, method, and aftermath included. This in itself renders the book the ultimate intelligent whodunit, but Philip's main, possibly inadvertent contribution may be the emergence of another profile of Alexander, which is a querulous, paranoid, delusionally megalomaniac, hostile, treacherous, and flippant person. In other words, a narcissistic psychopath. Fast forward 2,300 years. The government of the Republic of Macedonia has recently changed the name of its puny airport to Alexander the Great. This was only the latest symptom of a growing cult of personality. Modern-day Macedonians, desperately looking for their ancient roots in a region hostile to their nationhood, have latched onto their putative predecessor with a zeal that defies both historical research and the howls of protest from their neighbor, Greece. In a typical Balkan tit-for-tat, Greece blocked Macedonia's long-sought entry into NATO, citing, among, among a litany of reasons, the irredentist provocation that was the renaming of the airport. Macedonia has designs, they say, on a part of Greece. Greek politicians claim this with a straight face. 
and the denizens of this tiny polity have no right to the heritage of Greece, of which Alexander the Great is an integral part. This latest claim would have surprised Alexander no end. Alexander belonged to the Hellenic culture, there's no doubt about this, but not to any of the Greek polities. Actually, the Greeks were his lineage's avowed enemies. Newspapers and weeklies in a current day impoverished and failed Macedonia are flooded with articles and essays written by so-called archaeologists and so-called historians about how current day Macedonians have nothing to do with the thoroughly documented Slav invasion of the Balkans in the 5th and 6th centuries and are actually the direct and only descendants of Alexander the Great and other illustrious historical figures. If reality lets you down, why not resort to historical, self-aggrandizing fantasy? Alexander the Great, on the other hand, would have greatly disliked contemporary Macedonians. They are peace-loving, overly cautious, consensual, and compromise-seeking lot. It seems that their own government finds these laudable qualities equally offensive. It is beyond me why both Macedonia and Greece wish to make a deranged mass murderer their emblem and progenitor. There is little that is commendable in both Alexander's personality or his exploits. Having shed the blood of countless thousands to fulfill his grandiose fantasies of global domination, Alexander declared, declared himself a god, suppressed other religions bloodily, massacred the bulk of his loyal staff, and betrayed his countrymen by hiring former en the former enemy, the Persians, to supplant the Macedonian infantry. Alexander the Great was clearly insane, even by the cultural standards of his time. According to Diodorus, a month before he mercifully died, or more likely was assassinated, his own generals invited Babylonian priests to exorcise the demons that may have possessed their commander. Plutarch calls him disturbed. He describes extreme mood swings that today would require medication to quell and control. The authoritative Encyclopedia Britannica attributes to Alexander the Great megalomania and emotional instability. The encyclopedia says, Alexander the Great was swift in anger, and under the strain of his long campaigns, this side of his character grew more pronounced. Ruthless and self-willed, he had increasing recourse to terror, showing no hesitation in eliminating men whom he had ceased to trust, either with or without the pretense of a fair trial. Years after his death, Cassander, son of Antipater, the regent of the Macedonian Empire under Alexander, could not pass Alexander's statue at Delphi without shuddering. End quote. Alexander was paranoid and brooked no criticism or disagreement. When Cletus, his deputy, had a petty argument with him in 328 BC, Alexander simply ran a lance through his trusted general and had the army declare him a traitor, and thus justify the slain. The same fa fate befell Cletus' unfortunate successes as second in command. From his early youth, Alexander, Alexander has been reckless, though fortunate, and unusually bloodthirsty. He used the fortuitous occasion of his father's murder to liquidate anyone who opposed him, even implicitly. He then went on a rampage that alienated and united all the Greeks against him. Even his famed campaign against the Persians owed his success to the latter's precipitous decline rather than merely to Alexander's military genius. Long before he came on the scene, other Greeks, the 10,000, Agesilaus of Sparta, have defeated the Persians decisively. His bloodlust never abated. When his army mutinied in India and forced him to return to Babylon, once there, he executed scores of his satraps, military commanders, and other functionaries in retaliation. Alexander was known for his hubris and unmitigated narcissism. Using humiliating language, he twice rejected offers of peace from Darius, the great king of Persia, whose family he held captive. 
When Parmenio advised him to accept the second offer by saying, I would accept if I were Alexander, Alexander retorted, I, so would I, were I Parmenio. Parmenio paid for his independence of mind with his life. Alexander later ordered him assassinated and his son executed. He also murdered anyone who had anything to do with these two. When he tried to impose on his free-spirited troops the obligation to prostrate themselves, themselves in his presence, Alexander was subjected to such ridicule that he rescinded his decision. But he kept on wearing the Persian royal garb, and he did execute Callisthenes, an hitherto obsequious historian and nephew of Aristotle, who wouldn't bow to him. The Spartans held Alexander in derision. They published a decree that read, since, since Alexander wishes to be a god, let him be a god. Wherever he went, Alexander was escorted by scribes whose job it was to embellish history and manufacture legends about their employer. Consequently, most of what is commonly known about Alexander is false. But even so, numerous accounts of his drunken and violent reveries remain, in which he habitually murdered people and tore down cultural treasures, such as the palace of, Z of Xerxes. That Alexander was a prodigious imbiber of wine cannot be denied. Virtually all the eyewitnesses concur. Ptolemy, Alexander's bodyguard, Nearchus, his admiral, Eumenes, his scribe, his secretary, Chares, his chamberlain, Aristobulus, his military engineer, and so on. They all describe him as a drunkard. So do historians or re or who relied on such accounts. Diodorus, Plutarch, Arian, and the anonymous author of Historia Alexandri Magni, History of Alexander the Great. One could only fervently hope that the government of Macedonia fails in its campaign to transform its citizens into mini-versions of this monster. <laughs>